Hello and welcome to All, All Nations Online Worship.、Uh, my name is David and I serve on the pastoral team.、Uh, we're so glad that you're able to join us for worship today.、Uh, you know, the Bible、uh, is filled with commands, and one of the most common commands that we'll see in Scripture is fear not,、uh, do not be afraid. It's such a difficult command to keep, especially during this time. Our, our world is filled with pain. Suffering and uncertainties. And so, how can we not、uh, be afraid? You know, for the Christian, the ability not to be afraid comes from the knowledge that God is with us and that He is powerful. But not only that, that this God is also our Heavenly Father, that He loves us, that He cares for us, and that we are in His embrace. You know, God is sovereignly watching over our lives and over this world, He knows exactly what's happening. And he, each and every Sunday, He invites us to draw near to Him, to remind ourselves of who He is and who we are in Him. You know, we begin our time、uh, with these powerful reminders、uh, that we find in Scripture. And so today, today's call to worship comes to us from Psalm 27, verses 1 through 5. Let's listen carefully to these words The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on, on this Sunday, we as a community get, to, get together、uh, to gaze upon this God who is our rock and our salvation. Uh, before we sing songs of praise,、uh, let's go to him in prayer. Let's pray at this time. Come be all the wondrous mystery. 
Christ the Lord upon the tree In the stead of ruined sinners Hangs the Lamb in victory See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold Bringing many sons to glory Grace unmeasured Love untold Come be all the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grief could ever restrain him Praise the Lord, he is alive What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected As we will be when he comes What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. I've heard a thousand stories of what Pleased in that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers Far and wide, but I know We're all searching for answers Only you provide, cause you know Just what we need before we say a word it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. can hardly speak, be so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love. Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by 
I am It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am So perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Amen. Our God is truly good to us. When we couldn't make a way, He did. Uh, when we couldn't save ourselves, He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that now we can have this solid identity and this worth that is found only in Him. Church, we are His beloved. Uh, but we forget this truth all the time and we try to define our relationship on our terms and not His. And sin causes us to forget His grace and His love for us. That is why we take time each and every Sunday to confess our sins before our God. And we could do this uh, with honesty and vulnerability because God already knows, but yet he sent his son to die for us. And the assurance that we have is when we go to him in confessing our sins, that he is faithful to forgive. And so to lead us in this time of confessing our sins, if you can please read with me in Proverbs 28, verse 13. Let's read this together. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Amen. Brothers and sisters, remember that the kindness of God is what leads us to repentance. And so let's go to him at this time and confess our sins. Let's pray together. Church, now receive the assurance of pardon that comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 9-10. through 10. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we have made Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Amen. Our God is faithful. He is a good Father who listens to our confessions and forgives us. Uh, let's celebrate this grace by singing the song of renewal together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven. And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadow of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ my living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory Where my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven 
the King of Kings calls me His own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Father, you are the God who is sovereign. You know every moment of every day, and we know you are in control of all things. So many of us come before you today weak and weary. We have run the gamut from being afraid to being apathetic to even being angry. And these emotions have been exacerbated by so many circumstances, especially the ever-increasing dangers of COVID. They affect our reality and our relationships. And week by week, it seems to get more difficult. So God, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us more in these times of trouble. As you gave the Israelites manna and quail in the desert and led them by pillars of cloud and fire, would you provide for us daily bread and guide us in your ways? God, we know that there is nothing else that can save us and no one else we can turn to except for you. And this is not a false hope, but rather one that is grounded in the universe-altering reality that Jesus came to die for our sins and rose again to give us new life in him. It is a hope in the truth that we are not citizens of this world, but rather citizens of the kingdom of God, and that our purpose on earth is to share the good news of the glory of Christ. So Lord, would you be with us as we continue into this new year? Help us to share the love of Christ in our schools and workplaces, even if it is done remotely. I pray that we would love our neighbors through giving and service. I pray that we would support our fellow church community through phone calls and prayer. God, you have given us the greatest hope through Jesus. Help us to cling to that hope and share it with others always. Be with Pastor Michael as he shares your word with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us again online for worship. We're continuing our series through the book of Daniel, and today we've arrived at Daniel chapter 3. It contains one of the most famous stories in the Bible, right up there with Moses in the burning bush, right up there with, with Noah in the flood, Elijah at Mount Carmel, David facing off with Goliath. 
In our story today, we have three young men who refused to bow down before a king, who refused to bow down before a golden image. They defy the king, they're thrown into a fiery furnace, but are miraculously spared and delivered by God. Now, most of us have not experienced this kind of persecution. Most of us have not experienced this kind of heat in our lives. We've never been told, bow or burn. I mean, imagine that, bow or burn. But brothers and sisters, I wanna say this. We have all experienced heat. We've all experienced it. It just varies by degree and it varies by kind. And heat comes to us in forms of trouble or persecution and temptation. And so friends, we have all experienced some measure of heat. And when this comes to us, our faith is tested. When the heat comes, we start looking for ways out. We look for relief. We look for help. Maybe you're a college student watching today and you've been taking classes online and you've fallen behind. You don't have the same kind of accountability or experience as in-person on-campus school. You've fallen behind and now you're afraid that that you're going to fail the course. It's going to ruin your GPA. It's going to push back your graduation. What are you going to tell your parents as you have to pay for this class yet again? You are feeling heat. You're feeling heat. Or maybe you're a business owner. And during this pandemic, things have been so difficult. Every week, every month, every quarter, you've been in the red. You've poured everything into this company. You are doing your best your most to keep it afloat, but you're afraid you're gonna lose it all. That's heat, that's heat. Or you get a call from your brother and he tells you that your mother's in the emergency room. He doesn't know what happened, he doesn't know why, but the doctors don't know if she's going to make it. Your heart sinks into your stomach and you're feeling heat. That's trouble and hardship. Today, I don't want to simply hear the story of of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and wonder for ourselves, what would we do if we were in that situation? And just kind of like imagine that circumstance for us. Odds are that's never gonna happen to you. Odds are that's not gonna happen to me. And I don't want us to just fall into this temptation of, of reading a Bible story and then falling into hero worship and where we just make so much of these young men. You think, man, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are so awesome, such heroes of faith, and we leave it at that. We just leave it with this kind of distant form of of biblical hero worship. Instead, today, as we look at this passage and as I preach this message to you, I want us to see what real faith looks like in the midst of fire. I want us to see what true faith sounds like in the midst of heat. And I want us to consider the ways in which God is allowing our faith to be tested. Consider the ways in which God may be refining our faith and the ways that he's calling us to exercise our faith in him today, in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our circumstances. Like last week, I'm gonna summarize parts of Daniel chapter three because it is a long chapter before reading our main passage. We're told that King Nebuchadnezzar has made an image of gold, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. Perhaps it's because of the dream that Daniel interpreted. Daniel in chapter two told King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head, that head of gold. And so suddenly he was just obsessed with gold, gold as his image. We aren't told whether this image represents the king or the gods of Babylon, but the command is clear. When the music plays, everyone in Babylon must bow down and worship the image. And anyone who refuses will be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. So so the king gathers all of the important people in Babylon before this image. And he calls them to worship before. The music plays, everyone bows down. And we pick up at verse eight. We're gonna read from verse eight to verse 25. May God bless the reading of his holy and matchless word. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward 
and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Amen. The word of the Lord. For today's message, I have three brief headings, three brief headings. First, the fire, second, the faithful, and finally, the fourth. Okay, so the fire, the faithful, and the fourth. And now I want us to realize that there's more going on in this passage that is putting pressure on these three men than simply the threat of a fiery death. I know that kind of dominates the storyline, this burning, fiery furnace. But there's three other things that I want us to notice uh, in this passage. First, these men have the authority of the king against them. Okay? They're not just taking a stand on an issue. They're not just taking a stand on an idea or a policy. They are standing against a person. This is a personal conflict between these three Hebrew men and the king of Babylon. Second, these men have social pressure social pressure to conform that is upon them. Everyone else is doing it. Okay? All the people of Babylon, all the people that, that, that the king has gathered before this image, they are all bowing down. And you've heard the adage, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. There's social pressure upon them. And third, they have enemies out to get them. They have enemies out to get them. In verse eight, we're told that a certain group of Chaldeans, and these are Babylonian wise men, were maliciously accusing the Jews. We know that from previous chapter, Daniel and his friends, they were ascending in the king's court. They were wiser, more competent, more skilled than any of their peers. And so already by chapter three, they are ascending in Babylon. This certainly must have made the Chaldeans envious and jealous of them. So this was the opportunity to get back at these Hebrews. So they accuse, they rat out uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They suck up to the king and they provoke his anger against these three men. Brothers and sisters, much of the heat, 
Many of the trials and troubles we experience in our lives, they can be found in similar forms. We can be intimidated by a boss who has authority over us in the workplace. We can be intimidated by our parents who have familiar, uh, familial authority over us. Right? These, are, these are very real personal conflicts that we can experience. We can be afraid of social pressure around us. The pressure and obligation to conform to what everyone else is doing in our lives, in our communities, in our workplaces. And this has surely been amplified in this past year in our culture through social media. How many times have you wanted to say something, post something, share something, but you stopped, you paused because you didn't want all the pushback. You didn't want to be judged, right? You didn't want the noise. And so you just lied low, you lay low, you stay quiet. And we can have people who are literally out to get us, out to get us in our lives. They'll gossip against us. They'll, they'll, they'll be manipulative with the people around us. Right? Their desire is to cut us down, to take what we have. That happens in our own lives. And when we feel these pressures, when we feel this heat and this conflict, many of us are prone to shrink. We're prone to retreat. We're prone to give in to self-preservation. We rationalize. We give in to fear. But in our passage today, we see a powerful picture of faith. And I want to carefully unpack that for us. We see three faithful, God-fearing men. Nebuchadnezzar calls the three Hebrews into his court. He gives them one last chance to bow. He actually doesn't want to destroy them. He knows their skill. He knows their ability. He sees their value in his court. But he has a reputation to maintain. Okay, he's already made a decree. And there can't be three Hebrews, three conquered Jews in his kingdom who are undermining his authority. So he says, if they bow down, if they bow down, everything will be well and good. But if they don't, they'll be cast into the fire. And then he asks, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Okay. The gauntlet has been thrown down. And we realize in that statement, in that question, what's really at stake. This passage is not just a lesson on how to deal with authority or social pressure or how to deal with your enemies. This passage is really a test of obedience to the first commandment. If you know the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses and Israel, the first is this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. It's a test of obedience. And I'm gonna read the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego one more time for us. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Amen. Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary in Daniel, he makes the following insights and I just wanna share them with you. You see, in this response, you hear, you hear uh, just the heart of faithfulness, faithfulness to God. And we see a couple of things. First, they are sure of God's ability. Okay. They're first sure of God's ability, but they're not so sure about his purpose. They're not so sure about his plan. And so they, they believe that God is fully able to deliver. He has that power. He has that ability. He is greater than Nebuchadnezzar. He's greater than the fires in the furnace. They absolutely believe in the ability of God and yet they aren't sure about his plan. They say, but if not, okay, but if not, we're still not gonna bow down before you. And they're not just hedging their bets. They are understanding that the, that the, 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 the results that the circumstances of how this conflict is going to play out, it's not in their hands and they're not sure, okay? They know that God knows, but they don't know what his plan is. They were unsure about the circumstances. Would they escape the fire? But they were sure about God's commands for them, 
okay? So they don't know what's gonna happen in the circumstances, but they were sure of what they had to do, their role, their responsibility, their call to faithfulness. And it was that first command. You shall have no other gods before me. You will not worship any other idols, any other name. You will not bow down before anyone but your God, Yahweh. What mattered for these three men was not deliverance. Okay? It wasn't deliverance. It was obedience. What mattered for them was not the outcome, but faithfulness. And this is a fully balanced picture of faith. And, and, and Davis writes this. He says, faith knows the power of God. Faith guards the freedom of God. And faith holds the truth of God. Let me say that one more time. Faith knows the power of God. It guards the freedom of God. Not my will, but yours. Okay? And then finally, it holds the truth of God. What you have commanded, we understand and we will live by. We will abide by. Brothers and sisters, are you willing to exercise this kind of faith? Faith that believes in the full ability and power of God. Faith that submits to the paths and plans of God. Faith that will walk according to the clear commands of Christ and his word. You see, when, when we talk about wanting to know God's will, when we, when we talk about wanting to know God's will for our lives, when we, when we talk about wanting God to answer our prayers, most of the time, we're wanting to know the outcomes. We're wanting to see a specific result, a specific outcome that we desire. We're wanting to know the circumstances or change the circumstances that we find ourselves in. This is our preoccupation when we talk about the will of God, the plan of God, and God answering our prayers and hearing our cries. Right? They're so focused on outcomes, circumstances, and results. Am I going to get that job? Is this relationship going to work out? Am I going to be single forever? Are my parents going to recover from their illness? Are we going to be able to have children? Is our business going to get back to, 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 to humming along and, and being successful? And we try to use prayer. And we try to use God to, to give us what we want. To give us what we desire. To secure for us certain outcomes. Brothers and sisters, I believe we need a, a paradigm shift in our thinking. We need to stop trying to use God as a way to avoid pain or hardship. We need to stop trying to use God as a, a way to get us out of the fire. Okay, I mean, that's what we think. We're like, rescue us. Get me out, out of the fire. We need to realize that God has spoken to us. He has revealed his will for us. And he's done it in the Bible. You see, this is what the scriptures are. They're not just a collection of the word of God and the truths of God. They absolutely are that, okay? But they are the revealed word and the revealed will of God for our lives. Through the scriptures, God is telling us, this is how you are to live. This is what a faithful life looks like. This is what a righteous and a good and a beautiful life looks like. God is teaching us how to live through his word. And when we understand this, we can start talking and believing like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We can say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know what I have to do. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know what I am called and commanded to do by God in his word. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know what God can do. I know what he's able to do. And that's enough for me to know his ability, to know my responsibility, and to remember that, that I am his, that he loves me, that, 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 that he will provide for me, and that I belong to him, ultimately for us as Christians, by the grace and power of the gospel. That should be enough for us. We know how the story ends. The king is enraged. He has the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual. Even the guards who are taking these three men to be dropped into the furnace, they die because of the heat. 
And once the three men fall into the furnace, the king is amazed. He is shocked. He like gets up from where he is sitting and he sees four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, unburned. Three men fell into the fire, but there was another in the fire whose appearance was like the son of the gods. Now, some theologians say that this fourth person was the pre-incarnate Christ, okay? Pre-incarnate Jesus. Others will say that it was an angel or a messenger of God. The text is not crystal clear for us. There's no need to make an absolute decision between those two options. I do prefer pre-incarnate Christ as the manifestation of, of all the Old Testament theophanies. But what's beautiful about this event is this. God did not spare Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the king's judgment. He didn't just change the king's mind on behalf of his beloved sons. He didn't even spare them from the furnace. I mean, imagine walking up the stairs or walking up the ladder or getting to the edge and you're just waiting, God, God, do your thing. Are you gonna deliver us? And God didn't even spare them from being dropped into the fiery furnace. Instead, God found them in it. Instead, God joined them in the fire. And as he was with them in the fire, he protected them in the midst of the flames. Brothers and sisters, this is how God works in all of our lives. He always finds his people. He always finds his people. And then when he finds his people, you know what he does? He joins his people. He joins his people. And this is what God offers us today. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of our personal and shared hardships, in the midst of your loneliness and pain, he finds you and he joins you. He's in the midst of whatever kind of heat and fire and trouble that you find yourself in right now. Jesus Christ is the evidence and the proof and the manifestation of his love and his presence with us. Jesus Christ came into this world. He took on flesh. He walked among us. He joined us in the fire of this world. This world that has fallen, this world that is corrupted, stained and broken by sin. He jumped in and he lived the perfect life and he died on the cross and he rose on the third day so that you and I would be spared, so that you and I could become sons and daughters of God by grace through faith. Jesus joined us in the fire and he's with you today. Now you may be asking, yeah, but why? Why do I have to go through all of this? Why do I have to go through this kind of pain, through this kind of suffering when so many others do not? A lot of my friends aren't experiencing the kind of heartache and loneliness that I'm experiencing. My friend's parents are healthy. My friend's businesses are doing well. My friends are getting jobs. My friends are dating and getting married. We can ask God, why me? Why me? Why us? Why our family? It's important to remember that in the Bible, fire is associated with one of two things, judgment or refinement, okay? Judgment or refinement. Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment, right? When God speaks to Malachi, it's refinement. God has a desire to refine Israel and their worship before him. And if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian today, putting your full faith and trust in Jesus, the good news is this. We are promised to be spared from the fire of God's judgment. But we will then face the refining fires of God. You see, everyone's going to experience fire. It's either going to be fires of judgment or refining fires of love and discipline. Okay? That's a reality that everyone has to face. And for Christians, we will experience the refiner's fire. Peter describes this in 1 Peter 1, 6-7. And he writes, In this you rejoice, 
though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what Peter is saying is, your faith that has been refined by trials and suffering, it is more precious than gold. It's more beautiful than gold. It's more valuable than gold. It is a treasure. It is a treasure that God has given to each and every one of us as a gift, a gift of faith. And the whole purpose of that gift, of that experience of being refined by fire is to, to, to produce worship towards Jesus and to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. I know that might sound cliche, but that is the true word and work of God in our lives. The trials, the suffering, the heat that we experience, God allows us to encounter these things, to refine us, and make us more like Jesus. Would you open your heart to that reality? In closing, I'd like to ask three questions. As you think about your own trials and challenges, the things that you are going through right now in this season, I'd like you to ask or reflect upon three three questions. Number one is this. What is the clear command of scripture that God is calling you to obey? In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the pain, what is the clear command of scripture that God is calling you to obey? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew one. Do not bow to this image. And they, they held fast to that truth. What is it for you? Number two, what does it mean for God to join you and be with you in the midst of your trial? What does that mean? What does that look like, okay? What hope, what peace, what power does that afford you to really understand that God sees you and he joins you in it? And then number three, how, how can God use this trial to refine you? How can God use this trial to make you more like Christ? And if you think about that, And if you allow God to answer that for you, would you receive it? Would you you embrace it and say, yes, Lord, this is painful, this is difficult, but if this is how you wanna make me more like Jesus, I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna walk by faith and obey. That's my desire for us. Would you receive it as the word, as the, as the love and as the leading of God in our lives uh, as we continue to endure through this very difficult pandemic. I'm praying for you and thank you so much for being part of our church community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Father, we thank you for the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We thank you for this beautiful story of faithfulness and how it encourages us, how it challenges us, and how it leads us to place our faith in you. Help us to believe that you are not only with these three men in the fires. Help us to believe that you are with us, with the same zealous love, with the same presence, with the same power. I pray, Father, that you would help any of my brothers and sisters watching this sermon, joining us in worship. Would you help them? Would you be with them? And would you show them just, yeah, just how much you love them, how much you care, and how present you are in their lives through the ministry and presence of Christ. We thank you and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
grace of God has reached for me And pulled me from the raging sea And I am safe on the solid ground The Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Who is like the Lord our God Strong to stay faithful In love my debt is paid And the victory won The Lord is my salvation In times of waiting, times of need When I know loss, when I am weak I know His grace will renew these days The Lord is my salvation Who is like the My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Oh. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son Glory be to God Spirit The Lord is my salvation Glory be to God the Father Glory be to God the Son Glory be to God the Spirit The Lord is our salvation Who is like the Lord our God Strong to save My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, I hope and pray that as we go into another week uh, that we would uh, walk by faith, that we would see clearly the commands, the beauty and the power of scripture and that we would abide. We would abide and we would hold fast uh, to God's word for us. Uh, would we be that kind of church? Would we be that kind of people? And would we do all things uh, to the glory of our Lord Jesus. Would you receive now the blessing of God? 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you.